So hello everybody, and my name is Anthony Upwood, one of the co-founders of the Strong and Sustainable Business Model Group. This is our uh, 52nd meeting, and in fact there's a repeat of the uh, meeting that we tried to hold in July. Uh, presenting today, uh, we have Andreas, uh, who is, if I recall correctly, in Germany, uh, and he's going to be presenting about his uh, master's thesis, which he completed in July of this year, about uh, maturity group, uh, this is model innovation towards flourishing. Um, for those of you who uh, are watching on the recording, if you want to find out who is online, uh, please check the URL in the chat. So, Andreas, uh, over to you, and we will mute ourselves at the same as well. Uh, hi, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, we can. Perfect. And the people also in Toronto, no, in Brazil and uh, other places as well, right? Uh, I guess so. Yes, great. So as Anthony said, this is like uh, the repetition of the of the meeting of July. We had several technical issues, so um, I'm going to present again. Um, well, um, hello, uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Andres Alcayaga, and today I'm going to present you a maturity brief that I developed for my master's thesis. The thesis was part of the requirements of a master program in international information systems at the Friedrich Alexander University of Erlangen Nuremberg. This is in Germany. Um, the acronym for the maturity model is FBMMG, and this means uh, Flourishing Business Model Maturity Group. So here is the agenda. It has four main, com four main uh, components. Um, I will first uh, present you a brief introduction to the topic where I will state the main motivation for thesis. Uh, then I will explain you the research question and the research method. Uh, after that, we will arrive to the maturity grid, which is the, the main topic of, of this presentation and the main topic of my thesis. And finally, I will discuss some, some interesting points that uh, came out of the work I, I have done uh, during, the, during the thesis. Uh, so the need for transformation. Um, we are currently experiencing tremendous global, uh, social and environmental challenges. And for example, the, the acquisition of natural resources for human needs is degrading ecological conditions across, across the planet. And this is also undermining the capacity of ecosystems to regenerate and also to maintain fresh water. Ecosystems are losing the capacity to regulate the climate uh, on a global scale. Um, we are not only experiencing uh, an environmental crisis, but we are also experiencing a social one. And even though the, the economic expansion of the last century has brought uh, billions of people out of poverty, uh, we have created a system with uh, tremendous inequalities and social problems such as uh, obesity, drug abuse, uh, mental health problems, violence, uh, among others. Um, therefore, we need to build a sustainable economy. Um, but here comes the challenge. How, how do we do that? How do we address this question? How do we build a sustainable economy? Um, and yeah, we live in a world dominated by organizations, and the transitions to a more sustainable society uh, require the, the participation of these organizations, or, or in, in other words, uh, of the business community. So, uh, although many firms have announced their commitment to sustainability, and some of them have already adopted transformational practices. Most of them still consider sustainability a marginal concern. Uh, in consequence, we need to change the company's core business. Uh, a new source of innovation. Um, 
So in order to include ecological and social concerns, uh, companies are called for a change in their business model. Uh, the business model perspective is uh, especially interesting in the context of sustainability because it involves the generation of economic value together with measurable ecological and social value. Uh, for these reasons, for example, business model innovation is needed to tackle the, the pressing challenges of a sustainable future. And also, uh, novel forms of business models uh, may disrupt and reshape entire industries, as, as seen in the literature. So, uh, such innovations need to focus on transforming the core of the business model and on maximizing societal and environmental benefits. Uh, achieving the transformation. Um, more than a hundred of sustainability ratings enable and encourage businesses to measure their sustainability performance, but they fail to produce transformational change, uh, uh, the, the change that we need, uh, because they focus on today's best practices. And to succeed in achieving a transformational change, uh, business leaders need a deeper understanding of the gap between what they are doing today and what they will need to do tomorrow. And therefore, a new approach is necessary that equips businesses with the tools to assess their progress towards tomorrow's best practices. Uh, the transformation towards a sustainable future requires a normative and a meaningful vision for our actions to innovate the business model. Uh, this also requires a, a way to measure the attainment of the vision. Uh, so in, in, in the case of my thesis, this vision is called flourishing and is based on the work of uh, John Ehrenfeld. Uh, transforming a business model towards flourishing uh, creates specific challenges and imposes certain cons uh, constraints uh, that limit the action of a designer of a business model. Uh, so now, um, after this uh, brief introduction, and uh, I will present you the research question and the research method. Uh, my research question is, uh, how would a suitable management instrument for enabling the management of the transformation or innovation of a business model towards a business model for sustainability as flourishing look like? Uh, one of the key concepts uh, uh, of my research is transformation. As I stated before, uh, we live in an organizational world, and I believe researchers need to provide companies with tools uh, that, help, that help them achieve transformation towards sustainable best practices. The method of my research is design science. Uh, design science is mainly a problem solving paradigm. Uh, the goal of the thesis is to generate an innovative, innovative artifact that solves a particular problem. And the thesis aims to contribute to the solution of the current environmental and social crisis by giving practitioners and academics a concrete tool uh, for business model innovation towards flourishing. Uh, the measurement of the value or utility of the resulting artifact will be discussed later. So we have now arrived to the main part of this presentation. Uh, I will now present you the, the maturity read. The, the presentation of this maturity grid contains like uh, four stages, which I adopted from uh, uh, from some from the literature. So uh, the road, the roadmap that I, I adopted from the literature uh, contains these four stages, and the first one of them is planning. 
And as part of the planning, there are several definitions that, the, that one needs to make. And one of them is, of course, the name and the acronym of the grid, which is a flourishing business model maturity grid. Then the, the audience, uh, which are academic researchers, practitioners, uh, governmental and non-governmental non organizations. Uh, the grid has a, a domain-specific scope because uh, I, I have only considered sustainability management. The entity to maturation uh, is an organization's uh, value proposition, value creation and delivery system, and value capture system, which are described, analyzed, managed, and communicated by the organization's business model. I have defined three main objectives for the grid. The first objective is to generate awareness and reflection uh, upon current practices and their degree of sustainability as flourishing. The second one is to capture the current situation of an organization in regard to sustainability as flourishing. And the last one uh, is to enable an organization to determine a long-term goal to improve the maturity of the organization's business model in regard to sustainability exploration. Uh, another key concept of my thesis uh, is the business model. The business model concept is, however, at a very early stage, and the literature is very fragmented. And this lack of clarity has, have, has led several scholars to put forward uh, theories of organizational change to explain uh, business models and business model innovation. Uh, for these reasons, I have also selected the, the uh, theoretical, cha uh, theoretical framework uh, in the field of organizational change uh, that explain that, help, that has helped, helped me explain uh, the transformation process. Uh, as you can see on the left side, uh, the evolutionary and, and life cycle approaches uh, consider a prescribed or incremental change. And on the right side, you have the dialectical approach and the theological approach. And they, uh, and they consider a constructive or radical change. The main interest of my thesis is the, yeah. Um, we, we didn't quite catch, uh, due to your uh, accent, which of these four boxes you were situating the FB MMG in. Did you say tell you? Tell no, I, ha I haven't I said it. I haven't said it yet. I, I no, was going to say it. Okay. Uh, I, I thought you did and I didn't hear it. Okay. No, I was going to say that the main, the main interest of this thesis is uh, the theological approach. And this approach basically considers the, the generation of a goal. Uh, to explain organizational change. So it, it's like a continuous cycle, and basically the uh, organizations uh, define a goal, and then they implement it, then they evaluate it, and so, it's, uh, and so it continues the cycle. So it's the one on the, on the, on the right side, on the, on the bottom right side. So it considers a single entity and also a constructive or more like radical change. Uh, in this diagram, you can see the main design components of a maturity grid. Uh, it includes. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm just, you just go, Andreas, could you yeah. just go back to the previous slide a second? Yeah. Um, so we're in the bottom right hand corner. Um, can you, so, so I just want to play back to make sure we've understood. So the scope of the uh, maturity grid is. Um, single organizations, and it's also um, assuming that the organization is creating for itself its goal. Is that what you're saying by saying it's in the bottom right hand corner of constructive and um, what, what I'm saying is that uh, when you when you create a, a, 
a maturity model, you need to ex you need to explain uh, how is the change happening. So you need to explain uh, whatever the that that's that's what I, I can explain maybe in the next slide. But it's basically whatever is moving the dimensions that you have selected from the lowest level of maturity to the highest level of maturity. And for 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 this for this for this change to happen, uh, you need a, a, a theoretical background. So in my case, in my case, I am taking a theological approach. So I am saying, okay, the the change, for example, in comparison with the life cycle approach, uh, the life cycle approach says that the that change happens almost like a, um, a, like it's a kind of a compulsory change. It's a, it, the the growing ha happens almost by itself organically. And I am not taking that approach, but I am taking the one on the right side, of, so the theological one, which means that the companies need to set a goal uh, in order to uh, to become more sustainable. And that's that's it. This goal is pulling the organization towards a uh, uh, in brackets uh, better uh, business model. Okay, that's good. Does anybody else have any questions for clarification? Okay. Go ahead, Andres. So, uh, as I was saying in this diagram, uh, you can see the main design components of a maturity grid. Uh, it includes a set of dimensions on the left side, so from D1, D2, until Dm. Um, these dimensions can also be subdivided in, in sub-dimensions. Uh, then on the horizontal axis, you have the one to n number of stages or levels, and on on top of it, uh, you have the path to maturity, and that's what I was explaining before. This path to maturity is is, is your uh, your main theoretical uh, background that that explains how how come this change is happening from stage one until stage n, and of course you have a, a big group of cells there. That have a particular description, and and uh, uh, you can you can have also more than one because if you have several dimensions and several stages or several stages and several sub dimensions, then you will have many of them. Um, So to uh, to develop the to develop the maturity grid, I considered all the elements of of, uh, of this uh, of this framework of the both frameworks. And uh, the first the first one, as I have already explained, is the the path to maturity, or the most important one, uh, which explains the the underlying dynamics of the business model innovation. And uh, in my case, uh, in the in my in my grid, the the Business model innovation or the change is explained by this uh, theological perspective. Um, I have also defined uh, five continuous uh, potential performance levels on a continuum from a profit oriented business model to flourishing business model. And the theological levels reflect the intended and the normative outcome by the designer for business model. They, they represent both the current and planned uh, business model of an organization. This basically means that uh, you can, if you measure uh, your business model, you can, you can come to uh, uh, a result that will, is, that will uh, tell you what is your current business model. And also, if you plan one and that is in the, in the future, you will be able to have these two business models at the same time and use the tool for both So to plan the for the future. So here you can see the definition of the maturity levels. Uh, I started with a profit-oriented business model and ended with, with a flourishing business model. Uh, in the middle, there are three other definitions that I have partially taken from the literature. They are the weekly sustainable business model, the moderately sustainable business model, and the strongly sustainable business model. Uh, the definition of, of uh, 
uh, of the levels was actually very difficult and uh, this generated uh, several discussions uh, when I performed some interviews uh, so perhaps we can talk about it uh, later So now we're coming to the, the dimensions. Uh, the dimensions are on the uh, on the vertical axis, and the dimensions of the grid are a set of uh, seven business model orientations uh, that I have adapted and extended from six sustainable business model archetypes uh, developed by Dr. Nancy Botten and colleagues. Uh, further work by Dr. Botten concluded that companies are combining two to five of these so-called archetypes uh, and in their current business models. This means that these archetypes or orientations, as I have called them, uh, can be managed in parallel and can be combined uh, in, in, within one company. But in order to materialize uh, these different orientations, uh, a definition of uh, related goals and measurements is essential. Um, so each business model orientation is materialized by the accomplishment of three to four goals. Uh, I have generated a total of 22 goals and the, their measurements have been defined um, uh, and uh, I have defined these measurements accordingly and an important part of these goals uh, uh, have been adapted from the future fit goals. I have basically embedded the, the future fit goals in the maturity. The, coming to the cell, the cell text, uh, there are two extreme, two extreme ends of a scale for every of these measurements. So here is the first part of the maturity read. <coughs> As you can see on the on the left side, uh, you can see the first three uh, business model orientations, so three out of seven. And uh, on the top side, you can see the, the five different levels, now from profit-oriented business model to flourishing business model. Uh, I'm going to quickly explain you how how the how I constructed the the, the cell text. So uh, first of all, I identify the goal. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, number two, uh, creating value from waste. Uh, the first goal, uh, which is 2.1, is uh, operational byproducts have been repurposed, reused, recycled, or recovered. Um, in order to measure this goal, I assigned uh, two extreme ends of a scale from zero to 100%. And as simple as it sounds, I divided these percentages by five, uh, so that's why you can see that the, the uh, levels increased by 20%. Um, for viewing purposes, uh, each percentage row, so the ones in light blue, uh, they accumulate uh, several goals underneath them. So in order to read one of the lines, you have to combine one of the uh, light blue uh, fields with one of the uh, rows below them. Uh, for example, in the case of 2.1, um, if an organization uh, has a profit-oriented business model, uh, none or less than 20% of its operational byproducts have been repurposed at a particular point in time. Uh, in this respect, the read uh, has been formulated as a self-assessment tool. So uh, companies will need to define a starting year or month uh, for the measurements and then uh, another point in the future to be able to compare how much they have improved, how much their sustainable performance has improved. Uh, each of the measurements and that uh, apply result in a number from one to five. So uh, these numbers can be combined and, and can generate a total average for the company. Of course, uh, for some companies or some or some sec uh, industrial sectors, some measurements won't apply. So the company will need to see uh, which measurements uh, are uh, are best for for their uh, for their sector. Uh, Andreas, I think you have a, a, a question in the room here, and I think Simon's about to ask you a question as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm still not sure 
uh, where your numbers came from, like the 50 percent. Is it arbitrary defined or is it related to something you know, science based on it? The model of sustainability, you know, I, I'm not clear on that. Can you clarify that, please? Okay, the, the numbers are uh, arbitrary. But it's uh, the, the thinking behind this is that uh, we need to achieve we need to achieve a, a set of goals and most of these goals uh, I have ta I have taken them from the future fit uh, goals. So, for example, in the 1.1, no, we need to, we need to reduce the uh, emission of uh, greenhouse greenhouse gases. So uh, I just selected like uh, it's very it's almost impossible to ask to every company that. Uh, they achieve 100% of the goals. So I said, okay, 80%. Maybe it's a uh, it's a good number uh, for a first in business model. And this is this is totally uh, my design, and uh, there is no uh, there is no no science in the background. Um, also because also because the, these percentages uh, uh, they don't they don't indicate any uh, sta standard number. No, so it's a percentage. So you have a situation in the in the in the present, and you calculate, for example, in the 1.1, uh, your emission of green greenhouse gases, and you say, okay, I want to reduce 20% uh, per year, or I want to reduce 60% per year, and that's how it's that's how the 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 uh, the maturity is calculated. Andreas, I'm, I'm uh, curious. Um, you know, you have on the on the level five of maturity. Uh, why it's not 100% because future fitness uh, makes it quite clear that you have to hit all, well, actually, how many they have now? I think it's about 21 goals. Um, and you have to hit all of them because mo almost all the goals are stated either as 100% or zero. Um, so, was there a particular reason you chose 80% uh, for the, uh, uh, at least 80% for the uh, level five? Uh, the only the only the only reason uh, behind that was that I thought it would be very unlikely that uh, all companies achieve a hundred percent it was more it was it was it was more because of a practical practical concern uh, Simon has a question in the chat as well Uh, yeah, I see a question, but I'm not so sure if I understand what he means. Um, now, the, the archetypes. So basically, the, this paper from Dr. Gorton, they made. Huh? Sorry, Andres. It, just to clarify my question, in the in your previous slide on slide 16, yeah. you mentioned that companies are combining two to five archetypes, different yes. archetypes. Yeah. I was wondering if you refer to these levels, or will you be? Um, no, the, ar the archetypes the refer. Slide. No, the archetypes refer to the uh, vertical dimension, the vertical axis. So okay, uh, in, this, in this in this paper from uh, Nancy Bokin and colleagues, they defined these archetypes, and I have kind of taken these archetypes, and I have embedded the future fit goals to the archetypes. But I have changed. I have slightly changed the archetypes. Uh, um, for example, the number two, I didn't make any change at all. So create value from waste is exactly as it was called by uh, by Nancy Bokken. And in a later paper, uh, I think uh, uh, maybe from last year or from this year, um, uh, Nancy Bokken also uh, um, made a new research, and they they find they found out that this that this that this so-called archetypes. That they were not, um, and that the companies were combining them, so they that you can at the same time, for example, create value from waste and also uh, and, and maximize material productivity. That, that's great. Thanks. I'm not familiar with her research, so I'll, I'll take a look after the call. Thanks for that. Okay. Are there any more questions? Not at the moment. Keep going. Okay. Uh, well, as I was explaining, um, um, 
once the, once the company has defined a, a starting point, they can they can measure uh, how they how they perform in each of these goals, and and they can calculate a number from one to five. And if they make an average, they will get a score. For example, two point five or three point three or I don't know something like in between one and five. And they will be able to have like a, a like a calculation of their of their current situation. I am I am listening to myself. Maybe you have uh, your microphone on somewhere. I'll turn I'll turn that off. Yeah. Um. So in the case of uh, maximize Sorry. material. Yeah. In the case of maximize material productivity and energy efficiency to reduce the environmental impact. Um, this uh, includes goals uh, related to greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases emissions and other operational emissions. Uh, in the case of creating value from waste, the goals refer to products, uh, byproducts, assets, and packaging, and the possibility to, to reuse, uh, recycle, or repurpose them. And in the case of uh, substitute with renewables and natural processes, the goals refer to energy, materials, and products components that are harmful to people or the environment. Andreas, the mapping yeah. of the archetypes to the future fit goals, um, do, you, do you have um, anywhere an explanation of how you did that? Of the rationale of uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't have currently a, an explanation. Um, but I, this was also part of my design. What I basically did is like I took the definition of the of the business model orientations or archetypes, uh, and I kind of matched match the the these definitions with the future fit goals to to see uh, 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 which goals uh, were uh, related to each of the archetypes. Do you hear me? Question, um, Andres. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Um, I, I asked the question because um, Nancy's archetypes are um, only they're, they're based on current practice. Um, yeah, because yeah. She's doing a, a study of existing firms, and so uh, they are at best uh, weakly sustainable uh, patterns. But you very interestingly map. Uh, flourishing goals from future fit against those weekly sustainable patterns, weak, weekly sustainable archetypes. Um, we have done some. We have, we have done some. But, but, but not, I wouldn't say we've done it in depth. You're actually right. Um, so you're, you're right. I should say that they, we know that they're weekly sustainable. We don't know whether they are necessary and sufficient or only potentially necessary for flourishing outcomes it would be a fair I mean, so we, we don't know for example if there are some archetypes missing uh, because there are no examples for her to study yet um, so, so it would be quite interesting if, if you if you do write anything or have share anything about how you did that mapping i think both nancy and future fit would be quite interested in that and we, I would be interested in it from the perspective of informing the work on patterns of flourishing business models. Um, so if, if you write anything down about that or make a presentation about that, please do let us know. Okay. Uh, well, the, the matching I, I, I the matching I did it uh, considering the definitions. So I basically took both uh, definitions, so the archetypes and the future fit goals. And I made like an arbitrary mapping, so that's that's part of the design of the tool, uh, which is um, um, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, my contribution. So um, 
here the 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 next two uh, archetypes or business model orientations. Um, number four is uh, deliver functionality rather than ownership, and number five is uh, adopt a stewardship role with the environment. And the number four, uh, the goals they refer to the conversion of pro uh, of products uh, to what is called in the literature as uh, product service systems. So basically, you, change, you are changing from, a, from a, a product perspective where companies are selling products and change it to, to a kind of a rent, renting models uh, where companies are, are selling services. Um, the number five uh, refers to, to the role of the company uh, with the environment uh, in terms of water or areas of high ecological or biological value and also includes uh, regeneration activities. Uh, are there any questions at this point? No. So number six and number seven. Uh, number six is very similar to number five. Uh, so number six, number five was about a stewardship role with the environment. And number six is about a stewardship role with society. So uh, the goals here uh, include topics as the role of the company with the community, its employees, uh, its customer, workplace ethics, and uh, uh, information uh, information about uh, uh, companies' uh, products that may be harmful. Uh, number seven uh, is about uh, moderating end user consumption. And this refers to the, the extension of the product life, for example, by increasing quality, uh, reducing, reducing consumption by uh, changing uh, manipulative uh, marketing and sales activities, and the, the reuse of uh, certain products in second-hand market. So that's, that's uh, the, the, the last slide that contains the grid. Um, now we're moving to the evaluation of the grid. Um, so um, the development and evaluation of this grid evolved through uh, some rounds of iterations. Uh, I employed a, a descriptive evaluation method where I prepared some, some scenarios. Uh, and I discussed these scenarios with uh, some domain experts uh, in several interviews. Uh, the, the evaluation, of course, uh, is, uh, was purely conceptual. So uh, this is one of the uh, points that I will discuss uh, now, uh, later. Well, and now I will present you an overview of like important points that I consider like uh, that need to be discussed and also uh, points that may be useful for future work. Andreas, could, could you just yeah. go back to evaluation for a second? Yeah. Um, can you just uh, talk us through a little bit about who the experts were? I mean, obviously you can't name them, but in general, who did you talk to? Uh, I talked to senior researchers. Uh, senior researchers, uh, consultants, uh, but mainly people that were in the sustainability area. Uh, one of them was uh, um, in the innovation area, and uh, all the rest were uh, were basically senior researchers in sustainability. How about the scenarios? What, what kind of scenarios did you? Uh, the scenarios were like I, I prepared like a, a, a like a small description of a business model of a company, and uh, I, I, I during the discussion it was either that. Uh, the one of the options was that the, the 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 senior expert would come up with a scenario to analyze the grid, to analyze the functionality of the grid, and if they didn't come up with this uh, with these scenarios, then I, I had these alternatives uh, uh, like as a plan B, let's say uh, that way, to discuss with them the 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 grid. So it was basically like a written uh, business model. 
uh, divided in, in some in some in some areas. Something not so long, maybe one page. Thank you. So now moving to the discussion on further work. Um, Uh, first of all, and this is one of the one of the advantages of uh, of the grid. Uh, current models uh, only provide high level guidelines and strategies uh, without a pragmatic and goal oriented approach. Um, so this is, I think, one of the uh, most important benefits of the grid. And secondly, uh, the dynamics of the business model innovation at the unitary level. And this means uh, at the goal measurement level, uh, can follow any or a combination of the four process theories that I mentioned, as I mentioned before. So uh, this implies like more more flexibility for the designer of the business model. Um, this means that uh, in some cases uh, the results, even if you have, a, for example, if you if you your ethical background is a is a is a teleology, maybe the results are not as expected. So you can you can you have more flexibility to uh, to, to use any of these theories uh, to explain why why change is happening inside the organization. And finally, the because the business model is still uh, like fragmented and the, in early stages, the business model uh, do not define design elements of the business model uh, as it has been done, uh, for example, by Osterwalder and colleagues. Um, they rather aim to denote uh, directions for improvement of part or the whole of the business model and to denote a set of constraints that need to be considered uh, while designing a business model for sustainability as flourishing. Are there any that questions? Last, that last bullet, that, that last bullet uh, Andreas, I'm, I'm nodding my head in vigorous agreement. This is a discussion that we've had with Nancy directly uh, and in fact Peter and I in our paper proposed this as further research that should be done in the patterns area that she's working in and that is to map the patterns against uh, an, an ontology that can support strong sustainability so obviously we were suggesting that she use the, the strongly sustainable business model ontology that I developed to do that mapping in order to provide some rigor for the patterns um, and we actually have done a few small scale experiments with students here mm -hmm. uh, where we started that mapping process and uh, one of the things we discovered was that none of the archetypes is complete um, so they don't cover off all the um, elements that the literature says you should think about when describing a full business model a strong and sustainable business model um, and uh, I, I think Nancy has kind of reached the same conclusion because of her observation that multiple patterns can be applied simultaneously. Um, so uh, yeah, I definitely, definitely agree with your, your third bullet there. We, we have discussed with Nancy trying to start another project on this area, and I think actually Florian and um, Florian Bridget and Floyd from Germany and uh, Alexander Royce were was thinking about that, um, but I haven't heard an update from them recently. Mm -hmm. um, but um, in, in which sense uh, you disagree? Um, in the sense that the that the archetypes are not uh, complete. Um, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that this, so the, the archetypes are not complete, and um, the the archetypes as far as not as well defined as they should be because they're not mapped against. The elements of a, a strong and sustainable business model ontology. Yeah, that would be an option, but that's that's also the point. That's why uh, for this grid, uh, the archetypes or orientations, they they are only like direction directions uh, uh, directions for the future. Because let's say uh, creating value from waste. You know, I, I I cannot tell I cannot tell you uh, I cannot tell each company how they should create value from waste. I can tell them that they can they need to create value from waste, but I cannot tell them how. So that's that's the definition of that of that uh, of that of that definition. Uh, it's uh, it's very complicated and very complex. I think the point that that uh, 
Anthony was trying to make is that when you are doing this matching of the pattern, you have to make sure at least that you cover all the elements of the business. And so you need an ontology that covers all the elements of the business that you use the, uh, you know, the hospital who wants or to reduce the, you know, the, the upward flow. But you have to make sure that that pattern that you are analyzing covers all the elements of the business, right. which is not okay. Ah, uh, okay, okay, I understand. And, and I, I would actually, to, to the point you were just making, Andreas, I would actually disagree with you. I would say that having the patterns mapped against the ontology makes um, it easier to provide practical advice. Because yeah, well, some, uh, when you when you map your biophysical stocks and ecosystem services uh, and your resources and activities, which are four of the questions on the canvas and on the ontology. Um, you will immediately start to see where you're dropping into the environment uh, streams of biophysical stocks as a result of your processes where you are losing value. You know, when you're putting uh, uh, a gas up a chimney or when you're creating scrap, you're immediately going to see that. And so then you should, that, that should drive you to think about as you're designing your future business model, how could I first of all reduce that flow and if I can't reduce that flow, who could I um, who, who could I give it to or sell it to um, that will make um, good use of it? So, so I think actually mapping the, I think that the the fact that the patterns aren't mapped against the ontology actually makes the patterns less useful. Uh, yeah, but, you, yeah, but this 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 hasn't. Uh, I mean, no one has done this until now. I mean, to, to map the archetypes or patterns to, to the ontology. Yes, you're right. Nobody has done it, but you, you, were, you were saying you weren't certain that that would make it more practical, and I, th I think it would make it more practical. Um, but I would argue that uh, you could cover uh, the, whole business, the, the whole business model canvas or uh, ontology uh, with one pattern. Because uh, I don't know, let's say, uh, create value from waste. If you, if you if you have a business model where you create value from waste, you can, in theory, uh, cover all the elements. Um, and, and, and our initial uh, attempt at doing that would say, generally speaking, that's not true. That that you you the patterns don't cover off all the elements in the flourishing business canvas. So some of them, yeah, some of them may. I mean, it, and it's also not black and white, right? Yeah. I mean, so for example, in in the value from waste uh, archetype, it tends when you when you read companies uh, descriptions of companies' businesses business models that claim that they're doing value from waste, they themselves tend not to talk about anything to do with the people perspective of the flourishing business canvas. They tend not to talk about stakeholders or uh, ecosystem actors or needs. They tend to focus on the left-hand side around process, right? Yeah, and yeah, right. But, but that doesn't mean that the business model doesn't cover it. No, of course. The, 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 their business model, whether or not they realize it, of course, must cover those things because otherwise they wouldn't have a valid uh, business model. But the archetype that's, doesn't. That's, but that's, that's why I'm not calling them archetypes and I am calling them orientations because they are like a direction where your business model needs to go. Yes, anyway, so, so, so uh, oh, your, your uh, discussion and further work, uh, your first page prompted uh, some uh, discussion about further work, so that's good. Uh, talk, <laughs> us through, talk us through uh, the, this next slide, uh, discussion. Uh, yeah, well, this is um, this is basically what what we have already uh, discussed. Now, so new business model orientations is related to what you said. Look, basically, that I know that the archetypes made by by Nancy Bokin and colleagues are like a what is definition, and they don't necessarily contain all the elements of a flourishing business model. So it's possible that. Uh, uh, we could uh, create uh, new orientations and and increase the number of uh, dimensions on the on the vertical axis. The second one is about uh, absolute measures. Uh, this was also uh, part of the discussion with some experts. Uh, some of them uh, said that it was very important to have uh, standard measures 
that could be applied uh, for all companies. Uh, for example, in case of emissions, uh, this is like perhaps the easiest way uh, or the, the easiest uh, goal to, to measure and compare. But that, that, gen that generates also a problem because uh, there are some other measurements and goals that are very difficult to standardize. Uh, then the third one about uh, evaluating the grid in the field, well, uh, I think it's uh, very easy to understand. Uh, basically, all my work was uh, conceptual, so I haven't gone to, to companies uh, or to organizations uh, so that uh, they can analyze and use the grid. And the last one is like, well, more like real uh, <laughs> further work uh, to develop a, a prescriptive a maturity model, but uh, that would imply a, a huge amount of work. So what are your plans uh, for evaluating in the field and for development? Uh, this is the focus for your PhD? And not until, mo not until the moment. Um, I am planning to further develop the, the grid. Uh, and uh, to test it in the field, uh, but I don't know uh, in what form uh, and or under in what uh, or under what circumstances uh, that will happen. Um, but I am planning to. <laughs> that, that's good to hear. Um, I, I might I would encourage you uh, when you uh, are looking for collaborators and uh, people to work with you to make an announcement in the LinkedIn group to see if you can find other people in, in our community who would be interested in uh, getting involved in that work in some, some way. Well, this is the, this is like, uh, this is like the last slide. Um, so I don't know if you have any remarks or comments or questions. I think one of the important steps for you would be the field evaluation because what you will find is that in order to you know define in which maturity stage a certain organization is you, you need to, to go in a very practical way and link it to some of their reporting possibly and so on and, and that's that's a practical issue but if you don't solve that then you know the concept will never apply so evaluating it in the field and, and learning how to link it to the reporting, uh, you know, various reporting that are out there, I think it's, it's going to be essential. I think the, the good news on that is, is that the Future Fit project is making some quite good progress about making the uh, goals, um, the uh, key performance, uh, um, no, key performance, it's key, Key fitness, key fitness indicators. Uh, they're making some good progress in making those, uh, in understanding how to, what information typically firms are gathering that can be used to, uh, as a proxy for the measurements that future fitness would like. Because as you're hinting, Nabil, of course, most companies aren't actually gathering the data to calculate their future fitness at the moment. And it's, it's not only a matter of data, it's a matter of the reason I'm interested in the maturity approach is that companies who have different uh, consciousness maturity, they want business experience maturity, uh, their capabilities and capacity maturity. So not everybody, even if they knew about all the KFIs, yeah. not every organization can actually report on that or collect the data. So the idea is to find out how to you know, find the, the right interface to collect the data from the lowest level of maturity up to the upper level. But once you have, they know in which, in which level of maturity they are, then that is very clear you know, a sign of what shall we do in order to get to the next stage. So it becomes much easier to have both and to have so we have to go in that direction. Okay. But we have first to get them to to report in the proper way so that we can put them in one of the maturity stages. Reporting maturity is, is really important in the, the field. Can you, can you say anything more about your, your plans about the, your field evaluation, Andreas, at this point? You're muted, Andreas. 
I didn't notice that. Um, and not because I don't want, but uh, more because I don't know, because I just received the grade uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I, I, I am just starting to plan to plan ahead. So um, uh, maybe if you ask me again <laughs> in a few weeks, I can tell you more. Uh, but I have I I have uh, I have another question for the audience. Um, maybe um, uh, like if you have some insights or or general feedback about the grid, uh, do you think uh, it's a uh, it's a good tool that could be applied uh, in the field? Uh, like more like this kind of uh, insights. I would be very pleased to hear uh, like your comments. Simon, what's what's your perspective? Yeah, um, Andreas, I'd like to thank you for this presentation. It's really interesting just to explain one of our projects. We're working with one of the largest conglomerates in Brazil, um, implementing a very major change program. And this program cuts across every single one of their in industries from mining, plastics, metals, energy, um, fruits, paper and banking and I, th I think this, this is really really interesting it was interesting the conversation about the ontology and the interaction or you know relationship with the archetypes because I, I'd say just in terms of how you evaluate this in the real world I really like it and I really think it's going to help develop conversations around you know where companies and organizations need to be heading but the one thing that comes to my mind is just in terms of real practicality a lot of our work it's first we first have to do work really bring together different people because it's actually incredible just how senior you can be in an organization and not really have a detailed understanding of your own business model and have very different understandings of the business model for example people in the legal department marketing department technology department engineering department and so one piece of work we're doing before we move into developing a sustainable vision for literally for the next 100 years because this particular organization is 100 years old we're still doing a lot around talking about what is a business model and in fact the president of the whole group is just saying to us look we've got to help people really come together so I think it was just really that observation in terms of evaluating this in the field for me there really is this extra dimension and this is actually what's great not just about the regular business model canvas but of course the flourishing business model canvas really helping to really get this single view I think in this presentation there was maybe an assumption about having an organization having a single perspective on w what stage they're actually at but I think it, it's going to be a little bit more messy trying to evaluate this kind of in real world examples where of course you've got many multiple um, ideas and opinions about what the business model is but having said that I actually really really like it um, it's got a lot of intuitive appeal for me and I'll be very interested to follow you know the subsequent subsequent research on it thank you very much I appreciate it Um, Andreas, I was uh, going to uh, observe a uh, building on what Simon was saying that um, one of the values of a maturity grid is actually not to do with assessing um, where somebody is right now, but simply to have a discussion about where they would like to be um, in a coherent fashion. So by establishing this, the stages of the, of the maturity, um, and giving some sense of what each of those stages means, means you're establishing a common language to discuss what goals that organization wants to set. So they don't even have to assess themselves necessarily, they can all have their own personal opinions. I mean, it's nice to have no big one in a, uh, in a way, 
but that doesn't stop you from talking about the future in a more structured uh, way. And because you've informed the levels of the maturity grid based on the research that we've been doing about uh, where science says and where the you know, well-known human rights and ethical frameworks say you need to be, um, your upper, the upper end of the scale now isn't just um, ad hoc, which has been the case with many sustainability frameworks, it's actually based on something that you can defend uh, to, to agree, to, to a degree. I mean, we, we know that those things will probably change, but it's better than not having an upper end. It's the same argument that future fitness makes. Um, so I, I really like it from that perspective, uh, and, and I really look forward to seeing uh, the results of, of, of trying to apply it in practice. Um, so I, I echo Simon's comments that I hope you uh, continue to share with us and engage uh, the members of this group in, in this important work. Okay, that's I, great. Can I just make one other Thank comment? Thank you very much. That, have we got time? Yes, we've got plenty of time. Okay, yeah, yeah the other thing is, um, I think everyone knows I'm in Brazil where the language is Portuguese. I am starting to introduce this word flourishing, but it is, the actual word flourishing is not so easy to translate into Portuguese. There's no kind of direct word that immediately means flourishing. And when we talk about, you know, the sort of flourishing business model, the archetypes and the different stages, um, Andres, I just wonder if you had any insights as to how best to maybe translate the word flourishing in in Latin languages, Spanish, Italian, um, Well, um, I, I come from Chile and um, I haven't discussed uh, the, the grid with so many people in Spanish. Um, but I, my parents asked me, and we have actually a word that means uh, it's it's. I can write it here um, on the chat. It's uh, florecer, uh, which means flourishing. But it's normally used for flowers. So basically, when flowers open and and flourish, uh, 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 but it's not so really used in the in the context of sustainability. I mean, um, I don't know if you can find that word in, in, in Portuguese, uh, like a similar one. I'm not so, sh I'm not so yeah, sure. Portuguese has florecer, but it's the, prop it's the challenge of when you're dealing with a very hardcore, money-focused business audience. Yeah, I understand the problem, yeah. Uh, Miguel just said in the room, we, we were muted here, um, that uh, you should perhaps it would be useful to go back and look at uh, John Ehrenfeld's original uh, 2000 paper where he first came up with this definition of sustainability as, as the possibility for human and other life to flourish on this planet forever. Um, and um, that paper is really. Um, really helpful to explain why he uses that word, um, and uh, that that perhaps will offer you some insight, both in terms of how to explain it um, and and, the just, and justify it, and perhaps also some alternative um, language that you might be able to use around it. Because you will realise that the word sustainable can be also pretty bad, because you can sustain forever. In that situation, like just just surviving, right? And that that would not be the, the, the goal, you know. That would not be the aspiration of the human life. So that paper really helps introduce people to this new term, and, and then once they understand the, the logic behind it, it's easier for them to accept new terms and new translations. So, I, I know Simon, how do you manage to look at any of Aaron Bell's material at this point? Sorry, who? Myself or Andrea? Yes, yes, you, 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 Simon. Um, a little bit, not, not in detail. Yeah, it's a good, it'll be a good potential source, and I can use, you know, the thesaurus to. So uh, I, I, um, I think I have used uh, with my family also this word uh, prosperidad, which is in English prosperity. 
Um, I, I, I think I have used this like, like a, an alternative option to explain flourishing in Spanish. Maybe you have something like that in Portuguese. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you can have a look. Yeah, because the, the sorry, I didn't mean this to be too long a conversation, but the other cultural um, phenomena we have in Brazil is that often English is it's kind of almost valued more highly than Portuguese. So if you want to like advertise a business course or something, you often get more respect. People treat things more seriously if you use English phrases in a business context. So um, you know, even for something like business model canvas, you know, that doesn't sound so great, you know, when, when you translate it into Portuguese. So there's that kind of dimension as well. But sorry, I, I, was, I didn't mean it's, this to be a long conversation. It's the same in Chile. It's the same in Chile. It's the same. If you say something in English, it sounds very cool and people want it. <laughs> submit that's not necessarily the, the only the case because uh, in Germany where they have actually the full vocabulary for IT, I had conversations with people from IT, you know, 50% of which were English words. Yeah. And when I asked them, they said it just came into the language and it became a language of Africa and, and the, you know, so we all use it. And so it, could, it just could be a, you know, an agreed to vocabulary. It doesn't matter what language it is. It's, you know, you choose whatever they accept as common vocabulary. And if they want the English words, use the English word. You know, whatever word they want, as long as they follow in the, you know, in the thinking process. And so on. So that, uh, that might be actually an advantage to, to introduce the word and make it accepted. So, um, uh, Simon, to your concern about uh, taking us off course, I, I want to reassure everybody that this type of discussion we're having now is something that we historically have not been able to do very much of, uh, but was always part of the intention that we can digress and we can have a, a conversation of, of this nature following our presentation. So uh, I would say we are we are modeling our preferred behavior at the moment rather than a, a creating a, a situation we don't want. Uh, and I'll continue the conversation by saying um, that um, the Bauer Center for Business as Agent for Rural Benefit, which is a fairly influential group at the Weatherhead School of Business in, at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, which is now um, They have a, a conference that they've been running every five years as kind of the research and development arm of the UN Global Compact. And uh, the last conference they had was in the fall of 2014, and they called that conference Flourishing and Prosperous Business. Um, the next conference will be next June, uh, and, and several members of that community are part of our community. Chris Laszlo being probably the most well known. Uh, anyway, I was, I was mentioning that because for us, prosperous in English would of course have a tend to have a connotation of financial well-being. So I think, like wealth itself, as some of our members have pointed out, we have a, a group in Edmonton who has a project called Genuine Wealth. And genuine well-being, and, and they have reminded us that the original English definition of wealth had to do with being in a much more general sense. Um, so I, I don't know about prosperous. Does anybody know if the original definition of prosperous had a more general definition, or whether it was purely financial from the get-go? Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. There is, there is also. Um, I'd like. Oh, sorry, can I, just as another observation. In Brazil, um, it's interesting that, in fact, you know, there have been a number, I don't really want to name any because it's a bit controversial, but there have been a number of major organizations, extremely large, where the original, the vision of the original founders was actually very in tune with the flour flourishing business model canvas. The problem is that, in fact, a lot of these companies, they're still in the hands of um, private families. So I think maybe in Brazil it seems to be there are much more larger privately owned, family owned businesses. And in fact, when these companies um, kind of change generations, which they're, they're, some are doing right now, it is kind of upsetting to see the fact that they're actually going backwards and they're bringing in managing directors, presidents, executives, maybe from you know some of the big consultancies. 
and they're really dropping in um, at this heavy, heavy focus on pure finance. And there's one particular company where over the last year you can really, it's, it's not just monitor and measure, you really see in people a kind of lowering of any energy levels, a reduction in excitement, you know, about working there. And, and so that there's, there's also, you know, some of the danger is that some companies can take a backward step. And that's what's interesting about this model. It, it feels really intuitively strong. And, and it's not just, oh, how can we get companies from, you know, the, the lower levels to the upper levels. Also, the other challenge, um, my wife Maria is actually giving consultancy in one business where she's now trying to help the company remember the vision and the values of the original founder um, and say, look, you know, it's not just about hitting your financial measures because if you really focus on finance, yeah, you're going to maybe do okay in year one and maybe year two as you cut, cut and you really focus on certain issues. But then years two, three, four, five, you're going to hit problems. So, yeah, just, just to let you know from a pra what we're doing practically, we're involved in consultancy at, at doing this type of work as well, kind of helping people remember what made the companies great in the first place, rather mm. than just relying on dropping in someone with a heavy financial uh, and traditional background. And again, there are some very well-respected Brazilian companies with a focus on nature that they, they've actually had this happen. When you talk about ontology, um, you can really see that a lot of the people there they they kind of having I don't want to be too pretentious but they're having kind of an existential struggle thinking you know who are we now when these you know high level directors come in and try and mix things up it, it's interesting to see that and it's a shame but it, it shows you that we have to work in other ways and it, it's very much dependent on the context of the company and their history as well as well as the culture. I'll, uh, I'll add to that, um, Simon. Um, we've seen this problem in Canada too. Um, one example, uh, the credit unions here in, in Ontario particularly, um, who were obviously founded as cooperatives of their members with strong social goals to support their members' well-being in, in all dimensions. Um, and now almost exclusively, their senior management is now almost exclusively from the major banks here. And so um, they are actually right now, I would say in the last three or four years, in a process of rediscovering what it means to be a cooperative in order to differentiate themselves from the banks. Uh, because until recently, you really couldn't tell the difference anymore. Um, there's no me meaningful difference as far as we can tell. Um, so I don't think it's just a Brazilian thing. I think there's a, it, it's, it's to do with um, organizational memory. Um, people forget. Um, perhaps a, a positive example is, um, uh, who's the, uh, Yves, Yves Schwenard, the founder of, um, who I think you may know, uh, Simon, uh, the founder of um, Patagonia. Um, and California passed its B Corp legislation so he could actually reincorporate the company as a B Corp. He actually reincorporated on the very first day that that legislation came into existence in order to protect his legacy vision um, legally. Um, so um, that was uh, interesting. I, I put a question in the chat uh, as, uh, that you might be interested in as well. Yeah, um, I haven't been doing any work with um, Semco and Ricardo Semler. It, it, it's just interesting, he was so ahead of his time in Brazil in the 1980s. Uh, my wife Maria, she'd studied economics at Unicamp, which you can think of as, say, the Oxford or Cambridge of Brazil, their economics department. And it was interesting that she actually really enjoyed his work then in the early 90s. But a lot of her teachers and professors just were very dismissive. Oh, what on earth are you, are you reading this for? So um, Ricardo Semler, he's actually maybe received a lot more recognition outside of Brazil than he did, than he did um, 
in Brazil? I, I first came across him um, because uh, he was a case study that Michael Hammer used in uh, his business process uh, re-engineering work. And uh, it was a BBC TV series done in the early 90s about business process transformation because it became such a big thing. And there was an extensive section on Senko and the partners and how they were different. Um, so, uh, yeah, Andreas. Yeah, sorry to interrupt your conversation. It's very interesting. Um, but I unfortunately, I need to leave. Um, so um, the meeting is over anyway in the next uh, 10 minutes, no? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we pro probably we're at the end of our conversation, but it has been a very good conversation. Uh, and yeah. I would like to thank you, Andreas, for uh, presenting for a second yeah. time. It worked very well this time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, fi finally. I just wanted to make two remarks. Um, yes, it, it the first, was, the first one, the first remark was uh, regarding the, the literature. So uh, paper number 16 uh, is the one that uh, where Nancy Walken and colleagues uh, developed the archetypes. And per paper number 17 is where they combine or where they make, they make further research and, and they realize that companies are combining these archetypes and uh, to create like a in brackets, more sustainable business model. Uh, and I mean, conversation with Nancy about having her come and present that update to the work that she presented uh, to us earlier, which so we've, we've heard about 16, those presentations are in our uh, Dropbox. 17, we haven't heard from Nancy yet directly, but we, we hope to. And uh, well, the second comment was that uh, I just want to say goodbye. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, here is my contact information. I am not uh, at the university anymore because I finished uh, my, my master's, so I, don't, I, I only have for the moment my, my private email. But uh, I am also on LinkedIn in the, in the group. So if you have any questions or remarks or anything, ideas, uh, uh, just uh, send me an email or write me on LinkedIn. I am always happy to, uh, to hear comments uh, from you guys. Um, yes, so, thank you very much, Andreas. We really appreciate it. This has been a, 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 an excellent meeting, uh, and uh, we, we hope you won't be a stranger to the group and, and leverage the community uh, as you go forward. We're excited to see what you do next. Thank you, thank you. So, have a nice evening. Uh, for me, it's like a <laughs> night. good night. <laughs> Thanks, Andreas. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye. See you next month. See you. Bye.